So, this invited conference will be given by uh, Dr. Pero, uh, Pera Roca Cabarrocas from the Cole Polytechnic. Uh, Professor uh, Pera Roca is uh, electrical engineering from the University Polytechnic de Barcelona, uh, here in Catalonia. Uh, in 84, he moved to Paris where he received the, his PhD from University Paris uh, 7 in 88. After a uh, postdoc position in Princeton University, he joined uh, the Laboratory of Physics of Interface and Thin Films and located in the Cole Polytechnic, where he hold a position as a CNRS director. Okay, <laughs> just to know him a little bit, you can... Uh, thank start. you, thank you, gentlemen. So it's my pleasure to to share with you uh, some results, discussion, thoughts about uh, photovoltaics. So we are in an energy here, photovoltaics, and my background is very long. I have been working for 30 years on all this stuff, and I will try to show you what, what is new and what could be uh, coming for photovoltaics. Uh, before I forget, so this is a work of, I am trying to summarize 30 years in 30 minutes, so it will be a little bit difficult. So there's a lot of work with PhD students, postdocs, collaborations, French programs, uh, European Institute of Photovoltaics, that's the most recent institute we have just close to the laboratory. And this is the picture of the lab, and you recognize the no hair, that's me. Uh, energy context. So we have heard a lot of interesting presentations already about energy, and we know that the world is running on fossil fuels and that we are burning fossil fuels and making CO2. Uh, we have something apart which is renewables and in this part of renewables we, we have wind. We have, have had a very interesting presentation this morning about wind in Denmark. We have geothermal and we have solar energy. And you take all this, it's 1.4% of the global energy. So it's a very small piece of the cake. Uh, if we put this in a context of the world energy and the projection, uh, how it will be in the coming tens or uh, up to 2100, if you fall with business as usual, what you see is that the projection is that we are going towards 50 uh, terawatt of peak power. And then depending on which scenario you choose, this could be uh, reduced. But in any case, renewables are going to take a more important part of this uh, demand. Uh, I will be focusing on photovoltaics and because photovoltaics we have enough energy. The sun, we have a very nice nuclear reactor over there who is sending uh, enough energy distributed over the planet and in less than two hours the earth receives what we consume in one year. So the resource is abundant, it's there. And to convert this resource, what we use is solar cells. So this is a wonderful machine device where you put photons in, you excite the electrons from a valence band to the conduction band in a semiconductor, and from that you are going to collect voltage and current. So that's a typical solar cell. This solar cell you are going to assemble into modules. We have seen it also this morning, and the nice thing of this technology is that you can go from milliwatts for my watch to watts to kilowatts to terawatt. You just, it's the same device, you just connect in series, in parallel, and you can scale up without major problem. Uh, this is the map for efficiency chart. So these machines are working very nicely, uh, and you have a wide range of uh, solar different types of solar cells. Uh, Jenny Nelson tomorrow is going to talk about organic, what we can do with organic photovoltaics. We have the Ferrari here, the, so the record efficiencies, 46%. Those are triple junction, under concentration, 3-5 materials. And, uh, but if we look to the market today, all this is mo more than 90% is based on crystalline silicon. And this technology, you will have tomorrow morning a very, I think, a very nice summary by Professor 
Varda about oh, what you can do with crystalline silicon. Uh, if you look to the, so he's coming from Fraunhofer, uh, and if I look to the different technologies, what you see is that, so this is monocrystalline, multicrystalline, and then we have thin films. So thin films are the green, uh, all these curves are thin films, even perovskite can be considered a thin film. So most of the market is driven by crystalline silicon, uh, mono or multi. Uh, this is when I was doing my PhD. When I was doing my PhD, I was on thin film, and the projection here was that thin film would take everything. Well, we ha I have to wait. I am very patient, so I will wait a little bit more, and I will try to convince you today that it didn't happen in the 90s, but that this will go down again, and crystalline silicon, uh, maybe we have to think for something else, okay? Uh, but that's today, PV industry. It's, it's a really fascinating industry. Uh, we are going, I could start this one on the PhD. PhD was 100 megawatt a year. Nothing happens for 20 years. And then from 2010, this goes exponentially, goes with 30% growth per year. Uh, installations everywhere. From recent years, mostly in China. Uh, you have Europe, Europe, uh, Europe, everywhere. And we have today, in 2007, well, the last year, 2016, we had 80 gigawatts of PV modules installed around the world. And this was giving a cumulated capacity of 0.4 terawatt. So again, it's a small part compared to the total uh, energy consumption. Uh, along with the increase of production, what you have is a dramatic, exciting decrease of the cost of photovoltaics, the cost of PV electricity is going down, factor of thousand compared to the beginning, and uh, so where, where it will maybe well it will go to zero, maybe not zero because then there is no business, but it's going really really cheap, so PV is becoming a commodity, uh, and what is changing also is that the consumers will be the producers. We have had discussions about the grid, the central stations, and so on. The tendency is that you, because of the intelligence uh, that we are putting on the grid, we are, you are going to produce your electricity and you are going to sell the electricity. So you are going to do both, uh, depending on, the, on the your needs. So what we have is a very dynamic industry with potential for, it's a young industry, it's a very young industry. All this hap has happened in 10 years, 20 years. I mean, it's, this progress is extremely fast. Um, and we are going to hit the terawatt level so in, in the coming years. Uh, we have ha discussed about the cost of PV electricity. So this is 2015, 2016. And what you see is the cost of the kilowatt, megawatt hour for PV electricity is going really down from, so from 60 to 40. In Brazil, in Chile, $29 per megawatt hour. I mean, it's really four times cheaper than nuclear electricity. Uh, and so this is everywhere around the world, so it's becoming a commodity. And then I would say, okay, I went to Paris to do PV. PV is now a reality. This was my dream, c'est fini, it's over. Um, the dream has been fulfilled. Uh, and what the, pic the picture today, is crystalline silicon is the technology it's dominating the market. And the efficiency of those cells is really impressive. The record efficiency is 26.7. Theoretical limit is 29. So we are doing a perfect machine. Optical, electrical, everything is perfection. Uh, and then, okay, so then I could stop here, c'est fini. Uh, this, go, this will go and, and that's the, the future. Uh, can we do something else? Can we do better? And uh, can this technology have an impact on the energy, on this demand of terawatt level? If we put some numbers here, if we need this 46 terawatt and we want PV to take, let's say, 30% of this energy, of this, of this power, then it means that we have to have 13, 14 terawatts of PV if we think that this, the, uh, the time average output is 50% of the peak amount, it means that we need 92 terawatt of PV installed with a lifetime of 25 years. It means that we have to produce 
every year, three, four terawatts of PV modules. Uh, so this is three, four. We have today 0.4 installed. We are so we need to produce 100 times more than what we have today. How are we going to produce 100 times more? The standard way? Um, so what is the standard way? Let's go back to crystalline silicon for a moment. And that's the full picture. We take silicon oxide, metallurgical sil grade silicon, we distillate to have pure, pure gas. We use a Siemens process. This is 100 years old technology. It's robust, it works. And from this technology, we make polysilicon. And this polysilicon, you have many vari variations, but you make this polysilicon. This polysilicon, you put it in a furnace to pull an ingot. And then when you have this ingot, you make wafers. And out of these wafers, you make your crystalline cells. And then you, these cells, you assemble them in modules. And, and that's, the, that's what is behind the PV industry. So PV technology based on crystalline silicon is robust, is reliable, is getting cheaper and cheaper. Uh, but, 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 but that's the same scheme. Eh? We use energy. We use a lot of energy in the Siemens process, in the Shokrowski, in the ingot wafering. So I, what I'm saying is that this is so much, it's very nice, but can we do better? Can we do it more efficiently? And uh, so something which uses less material, because we are using 200 micron wafers. We are, when we slice, we throw away half of the material. So it's, it's it can, be, can, can we do better? Uh, we have to think about materials, and that's something which is true for all the technologies. And then when you have this chart of PV technologies, in fact, crystalline silicon, silicon is the most, one of the most abundant materials, so that's okay for silicon. We have an abundant material. Would not be the case for cadmium telluride, tellurium here, or for CIGS with indium, which is low. So we have abundant material, but we have uh, an energy, a process which is not very energy efficient. And if you go to this reference, Probably none of this none of the none of the current PV technologies met the requirements to get go into the terawatt level. So, what can be done? Uh, you would like I would like to shortcut all this, and I can do it. You can do it. It's in films. I can take those gases and directly get silicon modules in my production line. Uh, so that's. Now that's my topic. That's what, what, that's what I have been doing for the past years. And what I would like to do now is to show you that, in fact, there is much more than what we imagined 10 years ago when we start to go into these processes. Uh, historically, it's amorphous silicon. Then we developed polymorphous silicon. Uh, epitaxy. Epitaxy, making crystalline silicon. Can we make crystalline silicon cheap? Uh, if you think, for those who work on Semiconductors, epitaxy is high temperature, again, energy, and it's ultra high vacuum and expensive. Can you make cheap crystalline silicon? Uh, can you, we have, we need light trapping. How, you, how we trap the light efficiently and how we get carrier collection efficiently with materials which are maybe not so perfect. That will take us to nanowires and radial junctions. So, amorphous silicon, standard process, you have gases, we have seen, that there's the starting point for the Called crystalline silicon technology. Those gases silent, we put in a plasma CVD reactor, you put power, you turn on the light, you start to deposit things. And normally, if you are at low temperature, uh, 200 degrees, what you obtain is a disordered material. So it's wonderful, but it's disordered. And if it's disordered, you have defects. And you have defects, you have recombination. And you have lower efficiency devices. We will see the efficiency. But we can go up to large wafer size. Crystalline silicon is 15 by 15 centimeters. Here, the wafer size is six square meters. Or can be kilometer if you were to go for roll to roll. So we are changing the, the, the paradigm. Uh, and what we have is a wide range of materials, putting silicon, germanium, carbon, 
you can make a very r a wide range of materials that you need to convert efficient, efficiently the light. <coughs> uh, if you want to make a solar cell, just for those who are not familiar here, you just put your glass substrate here and you are going to switch gases. So, action, substrate, rough, a tin oxide, you do a plasma with silon and trimethyl boron, you get a P layer, you just keep the silon, you get an intrinsic layer, you put uh, the phosphine to the silon, you get N type layer, put the contacts, and that's your solar cell, which will efficiently, because you have a thin layer, now we are using not 300 microns, but 0.3 microns, so we have a very thin, it's a thin film, and in this thin film, if you put light, the electric field will sweep out electrons and holes, and with that you can make solar cells, which are 10% efficiency. Okay? Uh, let's go to that. This is the industrial scale, so that, that is not me, but it could be you. Uh, that's the machines which are used today for flat panel displays. Uh, so it's large area industry. Can be done roll to roll, so instead of having a glass plate, you can have a foil, aluminum, stainless steel, plastic, whatever, it's 200 degrees, and you can have a roll-to-roll -roll process where your modules are produced in line, and then you have easy installation of these uh, flexible uh, modules. Uh, if we want to increase, if we want to get more production out of these reactors, we need to increase the position rate, and to increase the position rate, it's easy. Well, you have a plasma CVD reactor, you put silon, you put power, and if you want to go faster, you put more power. You increase the power in the system, or the pressure, or the gases, and then you have higher growth rate, but you also have gas phase reactions. So you have problems, you, have, you can make powder, and from this powder, which was a problem in 2004, I will show you that today this is the really big issue, because we can make perfect material using not the powder, but the clusters the precursors of the powder. So those are the clusters, the precursors. If we have them incorporated in a thin film, we have this polymorphous material, which has medium range order and improved transport properties with respect to amorphous. And with that, we can uh, beat Morphy. We can show that Morphy's law is wrong. Morphy says that if something can go wrong, it will go wrong. Here, uh, what we have done is we have increased the deposition rate for this mini module. <coughs> by a factor of five, and we have increased efficiency. So we can increase both efficiency and throughput, okay? Uh, still, the efficiency is not high enough compared to crystalline silicon. We can make microcrystalline material, so we can make a material which is ordered, small domains, and if we combine, combine the amorphous and microcrystalline, we can make a tandem solar cell. It's again, you just put the substrate, PIN, PIN, you stack the cells here, glass, TCO, PIN, second PIN, and with that you are going to cover the wider spectrum of the wider range of the solar spectrum, and uh, by doing that you are getting, going to get tandem device, so the efficiency is going to go to 14.5, 15%. So we are going, well now we are increasing efficiency. Uh, if you can do tandem, why not to do triple? Just put another PIN. Uh, Someone there is expert on triple junctions. So triple junction, that's the record for the time being. Amorphous silicon, amorphous silicon silicon germanium, microcrystalline silicon. You see that you cover a wide range, and now you have efficiency 16.3, <coughs> VOC, field factor, whatever. But so we are getting efficiencies up. <coughs> and if we will go, if you look where we could go, uh, we could go to 20% without m any fundamental limitation using this technology. Uh, all this is amorphous, microcrystalline, not so perfect materials. Uh, interesting thing to highlight is that uh, industrially today, uh, it, people have demonstrated solar modules with a tandem solar cell, tandem structure, 1.4 square meters at 13.3% efficiency. All the technologies that you have in the chart that are very promising, we'll discuss it in 10 years, where is the efficiency for a module of 1.4 square meters. Uh, what is next? So somehow this is what is today. Today we know that we can go to 20%, 14, 15, 16% has been achieved. What is next? Uh, heterojunction. What is heterojunction? Uh, epitaxial, 
silicon germanium nanowires. Okay, that's what they have. So the idea is always to increase efficiency and keeping, simplifying the process to make the, the solar cells uh, cheap. Heterojunction solar cells is we are going to change the substrate instead of having glass or foil, where we are going to work on crystalline silicon. That's the, the battle horse, so let's take crystalline silicon, and then the same, you put it in the reactor, you deposit the intrinsic, P-type, intrinsic, and type so this is fast. It's the, those layers are really thin, 20 nanometers, and they allow to get, today, record efficiency, crystalline cells are based on this. So they already combine crystalline silicon and thin film. Uh, interest of this is that, okay, you have to put context, but the interest is that all this is taking place at 200 degrees. So we are reducing the thermal budget and we are allowing to apply this on thin wafers. If you do this standard process of firing and diffusion on a thin wafer, it will just break because of the difference of thermal expansion coefficient. If you have a thin film of process, you can work with 50 microns device or even less. Uh, if that's what we do, I have to show some results from the lab, so we, we can do 20% efficiency on crystalline silicon, no problem. Uh, but I am cheating, right? Because if I am taking crystalline silicon, I am still using this whole process, I am taking the wafer here. And I take in this wafer and I am making my PNG, my heterojunction. If I want to reduce the energy cost, I should avoid Siemens uh, making polysilicon, making ingots, and making a slicing. Uh, so, can you make crystalline silicon at the cost of amorphous? Can I, make, can I use this process to make the crystalline wafer? Everything is possible, right? You just have to... You, you have to want something and then it will happen. So, from disorder to crystal growth, epitaxy. So this was an accident, maybe, but it's, the, it's making experiments. We have, uh, instead of a glass, we put crystal in silicon. And when we put crystal in silicon, we run the process for uh, polymorph. So we have been working many processes, but we are today interested in epitaxial growth and making thin crystalline wafers. So if I put my substrate here, glass, crystal in silicon, and so on, and I do a deposition, I, now I'm going technical, I will use ellipsometry, I measure the dielectric function as a function of photon energy, and what you see is that same deposition, same process, on uh, glass, I have this spectrum, on crystalline silicon 111, I have the similar spectrum, so the material deposited on glass and crystalline silicon 11 oriented is the same, but the same deposition on crystalline silicon 100 gives a spectrum of crystalline silicon. So even if you don't know lipsometry or optics, if you get the same fingerprint, the same characteristics, it means that what I am growing here is crystalline silicon. And if you are not specialized in lipsometry, if you don't know, it doesn't matter. You can do TEM, you go to the TEM, you have the epitaxial layer, two nanometers, crystalline silicon, epi layer. Uh, for those who are still following, you will notice that here there is something. So it's not perfect. I am not perfect. Who cares? Uh, in fact, this can be, uh, we'll see that this, is an uh, this can be an advantage, okay? But by the time being, let's focus on this layer, the diffraction, electron diffraction of the epi layer of the substrate, I have the same diffraction pattern, I am doing epitaxy, but I am not using high temperature nor ultra high vacuum, I am using a sheep process, 200 degrees. Uh, I can make cells, so I can use this epitaxial layer, silicon or silicon germanium, I can make the heterojunction, and with that I can make my heterojunction solar cells. I can compare them to what people are doing by, M by uh, MBE. Um, we are doing far better. Uh, we can compare to what is in the literature. And what you realize now is that, okay, I am having efficiencies. People want in photovoltaics, people only care about efficiency. And I always say, I don't care about efficiency, I care about fuel factor, current, and voltage. And what you see here is that we have low efficiency, 8 to 9 percent, but if I put this in the context of the thickness, then we are very pretty well in, the, in this chart of efficiency as a function of wafer thickness. So we have very good fill factor. It means that this epitaxial layer has good, very good electronic properties. 
and we have the best efficiency for uh, this submicron 5 cell. The other thing is that this is epitaxy. Uh, ten years ago, nobody would believe me that it's possible. Five years ago, some people start to think, now people are trying to start to copy, so it's, it's true. Uh, but it also works not just on silicon, so silicon on silicon, but I can have also germanium epitaxial growth on gallium arsenide. Or I can make a multi-layer, sil germanium, silicon, germanium, silicon, you can make whatever you want. It's, this is the epitaxy. And for those who are on three fives, microelectronics, optoelectronics, opto gallium arsenide, this is the world of optoelectronics. People have been fighting for 30 years to grow epitaxially germanium on three uh, germanium, uh, gallium arsenide on silicon. It doesn't work. Here we have column four on column on three five, no problem. So we are, uh, we can do more, so we have a perfect crystalline growth. I will need one more hour to explain you how it works, so I will we can discuss it on the coffee break. <coughs> but the fact is that this opens the way to multijunction solar cells combining silicon and three fives. And those are the cells which have record efficiency today. This is done again in front of her by a PhD student from my lab who went there, a smart guy. Uh, and the difficulty here is that they are doing bonding. So they are growing a 3-5 cell, they are growing the silicon, and they bond. Uh, but bonding has issues. I can just have uh, epitaxy. I don't need any bonding. Okay? So that could be simpler. And we have been working on this low-cost approach of silicon on 3-5 to make high-efficiency solar cells. I showed you that there is an interface. Where it was? Sorry. There is an interface. If you have this interface, in fact, this will allow to separate, to detach, this thin wafer from the mother substrate. I need the wafer for the epitaxy, but I don't want to keep it, else I am losing money. So if I want to detach, I, I am doing a smart cut, maybe the SOI, Soitec in France, they are doing a smart cut. We can do a smart cut using, which is built in. So again, it's something cheap. And if you have this smart cut that you can tune, depending on the process conditions, then you can detach your epitaxial layer from the substrate. You can attach to a glass substrate, and then you have your crystalline silicon wafer on glass, on plastic, on whatever you want. I have how much time left? Half an hour? <laughs> okay. So, no, I, it will be shorter. I want to have discussion. So we can detach, and we have, again, a epitaxial crystalline layer on glass. And again, it's the same problem. You notice that the current, or the efficiency, is not very high. So how you get high absorption in a very thin crystalline, uh, very thin layer, thin film? There are a lot of ways, patterning, plasmonics, photonics, uh, whatever you want. Uh, my favorite one is using nanowires, because if I have a thin film, that's the point. We have a glass, P-type, intrinsic N-type, I put light. I have, if I want to increase absorption, I have to make the layer thick. If I make it thicker, then I have less field, so carrier separation is getting more difficult. So if I use a silicon nanowire, I put the P-type in the core and the N-type around it. This is a radial junction, so I can decouple light absorption and carrier collection. And by doing that, I can use less material to have a strong light absorption and still keep a good carrier collection. How you make the nanowire solar cells? Well, uh, you have guessed that I only know how to use a PCBD reactor, so I use a PCBD reactor. It's the same, and what we are going to change now is the substrate. On the substrate, I need something which will promote the growth of the nanowire, the 1D, 1D growth, not planner, 1D. Uh, so what we are doing is putting low melting point metals on the substrate, indium, tin, bismuth, gallium. And by doing that, <coughs> uh, when we have this tin layer, if we run a hydrogen plasma, we can get this 
thin layer into thin drops, which are liquid at 230 degrees. You switch from hydrogen to silicon, and then you can promote the catalyst-assisted growth of silicon nanowires at low temperature in your PCB reactor. You put silicon and TMB, you have P-type core, then you change the process, you go for intrinsic layer, you change the process, you put phosphine, so you are making your PIN radial junction in one pump-down process. Simple. Okay. Uh, cartoons are always nice. The reality is the... Oh, it's still nice. It's still nice, come on. This is a very nice, very nice SCM image, right? So you have uh, the P-type and a wire. We, have the we are depositing around the intrinsic layer and the end layer and the ITO contact. When you do nano, it's wonderful, but then I would need nano for terawatt level. It means kilometers and kilometers square. And uh, the challenge is to make square kilometers and it's nanometer size wires. So we have 100 millions of wires per square centimeter. That's a bit frightening because uh, anybody in the room will tell me that if something can go wrong, it will go wrong. You will have one broken wire and you will have one shunt. It's over. Don't trust Murphy, okay? Uh, this is our radio. So they are awful. Well, no, they are wonderful, but you have wires which go in all directions. They are free to, to grow as they like. Uh, we make the solar cells. We put the pattern, the contacts, and this is the IV characteristics. So I have a very high current good collection, BOC efficiency. So I can make a radio junction, which is working better than a single PIN, a planar solar cell. We have the excellent light trapping. And can you make a tandem solar cell? I, 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 we were fighting with the PhD students from Misra for some time because he said, I want to try tandem. He said, come, do the model. And the model will tell you that this will, not never, will never work how you match the current between the top and the bottom, blah, blah, blah. So we discussed a lot, and then he did it. And then when he did it, so that's the schematic, and that's the tandem solar cell, where you have the top cell, which in this case was amorphous, polymorphous and amorphous, but we can match the current from the top and bottom. Uh, you have it here, uh, equi from the top cell, from the bottom cell, and we are adding the voltages of the two solar cells. So even in this structure, we can make a tandem device. So what I'm trying to sell, tell you is that crystalline silicon is the dominant technology. It will be dominant for coming years, no, no doubt about that. But if I look in a longer perspective, maybe we need to find something else to go from the gigawatt to the terawatt. And for that, these uh, plasma processes allow us to produce a wide range of materials going from amorphous to crystalline from thin films, epitaxial to nanowires. And that's, those are the ingredients that we need to make a highly efficient solar cell using a low cost process. So we can make uh, plenty of devices. Uh, and so this is combining research, uh, plasmas, materials, interfaces, that's the devices for tomorrow. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and to discuss if you have any question. presentation is open for discussion. So, uh, any question? Um, at the initial stage, the life expectancy of these thin films were low. I mean, what do you think now? The, the lifetime of this uh, thin film technology I mean, I have solar cells, which it's 30 years. It's like... Uh, Same like others. Yeah, the sil silicon thin film technology, it's, yeah, like silicon. Okay, and what is the rate of degradation in performance with time? So the rate of degradation for amorphous silicon, it was about 10%. If you do the radial junction, you have no degradation. So, okay. yeah. Hi, 
Hi, I'm Shelley. Um, thank you for a lovely talk. Uh, at the start of your presentation, you mentioned that <coughs> there was a max. Oh, sorry, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Uh, there was a maximum 29% roughly yield. Uh, could you efficiency? Efficiency. Yeah. yeah. Could you mention um, what factors make that value so low? That 29% uh, shock requires a limit. This is given because if you have a solar cell with once only one material, if I go to a single junction device, I have to go up. Uh, here we are. So, if you have, you take a semiconductor, crystalline silicon, up, uh, uh, gap at here at 1,000 nanometers, all these photons are not absorbed. So you have already 30% of the energy which is lost by transmission, and if you take the high energy photons which are absorbed in crystalline silicon, but you have all this, this is all the, the, all the energy which is available, but the carriers which have 5 EV, the photons which have 5 EV, you will only reco recover one over five. So this is thermalization. So it's thermalization losses, transmission losses, single junction, 29, 30, depending on which material. And that's why then you have to do, up, trip this 46%, this is when you combine one, two, three, four cells, and you minimize the thermalization for each cell. And just a quick follow-up, uh, how high do you think that that could go in coming years? Uh, you can go to 60. To Thank you there is no, th th uh, theoretically, theoretically, you can go 50. I'm sure we will see it coming up. Yep. It's a matter of how much, where, peop, where the effort is going. And uh, for each technology, you, for example, here you have, you have nothing happens, there is a jump. It's when people put effort on that technology, it can go up. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, just I have another question regarding using uh, nanowires, silicon nanowires, for improving energy efficiency for yeah. solar cells. In the last part of your uh, presentation, you mentioned that the energy efficiency is about 9%. Yes. Do you think, because I have seen other research projects in this field, uh, I don't remember the name, it's German, he used different methods, which is uh, vapor, liquid, solid. VLS, yeah. Uh, yeah, and he got about the energy efficiency was about 17%. So uh, be careful. Yeah. It depends on the substrate. If you are having the nanowires on a crystalline silicon wafer, yeah, you can get 17%. But yeah. on a crystalline wafer, the target is 26, not yeah. 17. Yeah, it's upper than that. Do you think your, in a, your technique, which you have developed right now, or which you, uh, we have done the modeling for the tandem amorphous microcrystalline, and yeah. we can get reasonable, reasonably get 15% efficiency. So yeah. Uh, if I make triple, then the model in the I have shown you can go to 20%. That's good. And I think that's what, and then efficiency, it's one part, but it's not all. What matters is efficiency, cost, manufacturability, and how cheap can I produce, and how many square kilometers, terawatts I can produce. Yeah, because in some research, they use these techniques for producing hydrogen as well, just by catalyzing new water. Yeah. So this is the difference, because sometimes the energy efficiency is about 26, as you said before. And in the meantime, the solar cells, they use it just for catalyzing water into different parts. So one solar cell for producing hydrogen and electricity by using off and wires. Have you heard about this technology? If I can make a solar, whatever solar cell is producing electricity, then you can make uh, hydrolysis. That's yeah, from the same design, I mean. Yeah. Anyway, thank you so much for answering. Any other question? If not, we thanks to the speaker. Thank you.